chapter 2. And Lord Jesus, now as we open up the word, uh, Lord, may we just continue to worship you uh, in our hearts, Lord. Uh, Lord, may you challenge us today. Uh, Lord, may you grow us. Lord, as we hear your word, your living word, uh, Lord, uh, may you just work in our hearts. Uh, may you grow us closer to you. May we be more like you. And uh, Jesus, uh, may we just uh, know you more and make you known. Uh, Lord, uh, open up our hearts, write upon our hearts today, Lord, those things you want us to know. And Lord Jesus, uh, we would just reflect you in this uh, dark and fallen world. We thank you so much for you. We thank you for uh, just uh, being here, that we can worship you now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have been following the events of the world here recently in the Middle East, uh, in which numerous governments we're, we're seeing uh, in recent days, uh, as the people have been chanting for change, uh, new governments are now taking place of the old. Uh, and we see people on the news saying how glad they are to be part of the protests, although in some cases it's costing their lives to be there. Uh, the people of Libya. You know, you know, they say that there's probably over a thousand, at least, that have been killed in these in these uh, in these protests, as the government now starts to uh, to fight back against the people. Uh, but these people, they're hopeful for change. Uh, they're hopeful that something is coming into their lives that will uh, make life that much better for them. And yes, even you know, in our nation. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, you you heard that same cry, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, when we elected a new president, and everybody was going, oh, we're going in a new direction. Everything's going to be great. Uh, and we see two years later, well, we we wanted to change direction again, <laughs> and so we put in a new, we put in a, a new house. We have uh, you know. Uh, they have a, a, a new party in one of the chambers of the government. And yet, come Friday, uh, if they don't pass a budget, they will be shut down. And so we go, well, you know, all of us are going, we're looking for somebody to come in and be that leader that can take and make everything great, everything perfect. But if you're going to put your trust in man, it's not going to happen. There's only one that can come and fill and fill that void and will not fail you, and that's Jesus Christ. You know, uh, government will not run right until he returns, because he is the government. You know, he is the he is the one who can rule. You know. What do you call it? You know, our, our hope should be in Him. And we don't need to bring down governments, but we need to tell people about Jesus. You know, He'll come in one day. Uh, it tells us that He will rule with a rod of iron. You know, He will rule with authority. You know, He's going to rule rightly. He's going to rule effectively. You know, it tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. So if you're looking for democracy one day, uh, that's not what's coming. What's coming is the King. He is coming. You know, it's going to be wonderful when He returns. You know, it tells us that the lion will lie down with the lamb. You know, the kids will be able to play with, with snakes and not worry about them biting them. You know, everything's going to run perfectly when he returns. You know, in, in the book of Matthew, he is showing us that Jesus is king. He came to Israel as the king of Israel. But we know as the story goes that the nation of Israel rejected him. Matthew, though, as, as we saw last week, 
His main goal is to present Jesus as the king. He is the king of the Jews. We saw Matthew start out with the genealogy of Jesus in chapter 1. Because in order to be a king, you have to show that you have the right to the throne. And since he is claiming to be the heir of the throne, you know, he has to show his claim to it. And that, show, that was shown throughout the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He is the only living Jew today in the world that has genealogical records to stake the claim as king, as being the Messiah. All the other records, they've been destroyed. All the way, you know, back, in, back when the Romans came in in A.D. 70, all of the genealogical records were destroyed. So today, Jesus, the only one who can trace his lineage back to David, back to Father Abraham. And this is who Messiah would be. So not only did we see it stated in the genealogy that Jesus has the right to be to the throne, but we also see it theologically that he is a descendant of David, and that he and that this Jesus, his heritage, that that he is a, that he is the King of the Jews. And so, what do you call it? Therefore, you know, uh, what do you call it? Does anybody else acknowledge his deity? And that's what we're going to get to in chapter 2 today. The acknowledgement of his deity. Does anyone ratify it or recognize it? And you see, henceforth, here we got our tax collector. And the one that keeps the strict records. Now these things are being are going to be are going to be written down in chapter 2 to show you that indeed someone else has recognized him and has ratified, hey, this is the king. This is the king of the Jews. His heritage being established in chapter 1, and now we see the homage to the king in chapter 2. Yeah, the people uh, the people did recognize indeed that he was who he said he is, the king. And so we see here in verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, it tells us, you know, if you were here last Wednesday night, we took some time as we discussed Herod, you know, who is mentioned here in this, in this story. Uh, the name Herod was a line of these kings. And... Uh, what do you call it? And this, and this individual Herod here uh, was known as Herod the Great. That's what history would record of it. Not because he was this great, great ruler, uh, as, uh, as I'll tell you here in a moment. Uh, uh, Herod was quite uh, the monster. <laughs> uh, the time he came to power, about 37 BC, he was appointed by Mark Anthony to be king of Judea. Uh, he takes the throne, and, and him trying possibly, you know, probably to prove himself, only being about four foot, uh, four inches tall. Okay, so you got this short little guy. He wants to make a big impact, though, showing that he could accomplish big things. So if you get this picture, a lot of times you see the movie, Herod's this big dude, you know. Uh, no. This guy Herod, he erected big things. Uh, he built cities, he built palaces, aqueducts, uh, and he remodeled the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, But this man may have accomplished these tasks, but he goes down in history as a cruel and horrible man. Uh, one night, it's recorded that when, he, when getting mad at his wife, that he murdered her, and then he killed his three sons. The next day, he's feeling bad about it. Makes you wonder why. He was feeling bad about it. And he built this huge tower in Jerusalem that still stands to this day. You know, and, uh, and, he, and he built this for his wife and his sons that he had murdered. Because he, he thought, well, this will make me feel better. Caesar Augustus said, it, it's safer to be Herod's pig than to be his son. 
And no one really liked him because he was so mean. <coughs> You know, when he got old, he realized that no one was going to mourn his passing. So he goes out, gets a hundred of the leading men of Jerusalem. And he places them in prison and commands that the moment that he dies, that these 100 leading men were to be killed on the spot. Uh, if they, he said, if they won't mourn for me, uh, then let them mourn for these hundred men that were placed to death on my death. Uh, his last command was not carried out. Uh, these men were set free upon his death. Uh, he was powerful but an arrogant individual. Uh, he was, you know, he was ruling in the time of Jer in Jerusalem that Jesus was born. So it says, you know, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, you, you may have seen numerous movies, manger scenes. These wise men, you know, the, all the, the wise men in these manger scenes. Uh, and you need to put those pictures and the mangers out of your minds. Uh, first, there, there's no reason for us to believe that there were only three. Uh, does it say that here? It says, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. You know, there could have been over 300 of them. We, we don't know. It. It's, not, it's, not, it's not recorded for us. The text doesn't tell us. Uh, the word wise men in other translations, such as the old King Jimmy, uh, are called, uh, what do you call these individuals, were magi. It's where we get our word uh, magician. Uh, they were ones that studied the stars, who studied astronomy, uh, but they also studied astrology. Uh, they were very into dreams and dream interpretations. You know, it was, it was a mixture of a, of a cultic type of activities and religion from the region that they came from, most likely that of Babylon. So that would be today, present day, probably in present day Iraq. So they see this star and they start going towards the star. Why? Because, well, there was a man who centuries earlier was also this interpreter of dreams. Okay? And his name was Daniel. Uh, Daniel, who was a prophet, uh, he was elevated to a high position in the kingdom. He wrote in chapter, he wrote in chapter 7 of his book, which you have his book in your Bibles, the book of Daniel, uh, that, that one was coming that was called the Ancient of Days. Uh, and this is what he writes of him in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place. <coughs> and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame and wheels of burning fire. It's wheels of burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him. A thousand thousand ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And then he would go on to say in verse 14 of that same chapter, it says, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel talking about the Messiah. Uh, you know, this would be that the one that will be coming, and he will rule and reign. But in Daniel chapter 9, around verse 25, Daniel would go on to tell us the exact day that the Ancient of Days would be coming to present himself as king. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, the streets shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. 
Okay, this would be 100, 172,880 days. It would come. It would. It would be. Uh, what do you call it? It would come from the decree that the king would give to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This would be the amount of days it would be until he came. Uh, March 14th, 445 B.C. King Artaxerxes said that Jerusalem was to be rebuilt. If you go and you do the math, just as Daniel 9 states, it takes you to the exact day that Jesus is riding in on the back of a donkey on Palm Sunday. That's the day that he rode into Jerusalem. Ever wondered why all the people were out there? Saying, you know, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is why, because they knew the prophecy that this would be the time that Messiah would come in. 